David, we should have stand still on some of our major highways. We'll have a lot of hazardous waste for the whole of right? So my name is Brandi Scalace. I'm at the Dietrich Museum of Medical History, and it's right here on Case Western's campus. Uh, it's across the street from Severance Hall. I like to call it Severance Light. It's a bit small. We're on the third floor, and one of the things I love about working there is that it's full of surprises, but also that a lot of the stories that I know, you probably don't. So it is a rather untold place to work, and you can really find a lot of fascinating narratives while there. You should come check us out. Today, I'm here to talk to you about steampunk science. And if there's one thing that I have noticed when I talk about steampunk is the world is separated into two parts. Those who think steampunk is awesome and rules. If you're here, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. And those who go, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so I'm going to say a few words about that. Steampunk is often thought of as an aesthetic. It has a very visual quality to it. And in that vein, I'm going to give a bit of a description here. So let's imagine the wheel turns, the gears are going, you see sails expanding with an electromagnetic whirring, and a behemoth airship rises into view. And at the helm is a Victorian-clad gentleman with a jaunty top hat and goggles of some various lenses, probably a cane that might be a hidden or concealed weapon of some kind turns into some other mechanical device. This is the science fiction of Victoriana about a past that never actually was and a future that never actually will be. It has the suave of James Bond and the savvy of Sherlock Holmes, and it's fiction, not fact. But what if it isn't? What if some of those strange gadgets and gizmos and technologies have a place in actual history, in medical history, in scientific progress? So today, I'm going to take you on a journey of those innovators, physicians, intrepid and curious souls who help to bring medicine into the modern age. And not only about progress, but about consequence. So, steampunk. We usually can recognize it when we see it. And what I have up here behind me are some cosplayers. They are dressed in the sort of steampunk attire. But on the other side, the actual workers with um, their usual garb in the 19th century. And as you can tell, it's maybe a little less sexy and a lot less female. <laughs> but, no corsets. I don't know. I looked in all these photographs. <laughs> but we can recognize it. In fact, many of you have probably seen films or read books that actually are steampunk in nature. The Robert Downey Jr. Uh, reboot of Sherlock Holmes. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that was also made into a movie. And some various different books that have been written recently, including Whitechapel Gods, which has a lot to do with clockwork. So why steampunk? And why now? Why are we so interested in it now? It's actually become a very popular genre. Some people have suggested that it's our disillusionment with technology as it is today. So for instance, many of you have smartphones. They all look the same. If they rang, you would all check. Uh, there's something about it that's not exactly unique. Something about the Victorian technology, or Victorian technology was very different. It was unique, it was craftsman, everything was different. It wasn't on an assembly line necessarily, or even if it was, it had an element to it that you could change, that you could adapt. Um, in the Dittrich Museum, we have a lot of forceps, and literally there's forceps where there's tiny little differences and tiny changes made by multiple doctors. There's something about that that we really enjoy, and in fact, we're kind of nostalgic for it. The idea of brass buttons and gears and cogs and all this clockwork really matters to us. And in that sense, I think we long for an era before a petroleum economy when things were run by steam. However, clockwork does have its downside. So behind me now is the astrological, prog, uh, astrological clock of Prague. I've seen it. It's huge. It's enormous. It's imposing. And it has a little automaton on it. One's a skeleton. He has an hourglass and he tolls a bell in case you wondered where all that time was leading you. In addition, um, it has the world, basically. It's, it's astrological, so it shows the sun going around the earth like it did in 1410. Uh, but even, even reboots on this technology, uh, newer things after we understood the solar system a bit better, show the universe in perfect working order. And when we say something runs like clockwork, we mean it's precise in design. 
we like that idea. We want our medicine and our science and technology to be precise and accurate and correct. It makes us feel very good. But then again, what I have here is the world's largest cuckoo clock. Uh, it's in Ohio. <laughs> it's in Sugar Creek, and I lived near there. And so when I was a small child, my grandmother thought it would be a great treat to take me to the world's largest cuckoo clock. So I'm four. Uh, Actually, I might have even been younger than that. She takes me there, and at, when the clock strikes, a giant bird hops out the top window, and these little automatons come hoving into view, playing polka music with their smiley painted faces, and I was terrified. <laughs> they're my size. Like, they were just horrifying. And it's, they looked alive. They looked alive. And when something's almost human, but not quite human, and it troubles us, we frequently say it's uncanny, that the uncanny valley is uh, something that describes this. We just feel unsettled by that. And I had nightmares for years after this experience. <laughs> Thought clockwork was coming to get me. And while this might uh, just show you that I had an overactive imagination as a child, I'm not alone. There is something that we fear about technology. We fear that machines might replace us, or that technology is somehow not good for us, that it might crush us under its rapidly spinning wheels. And so, as we look at the history of medicine and technology and scientific progress, it's very important to remember the human at the center. Human-centered progress as opposed to something that forgets about what all of this medical and scientific progress is for. So, dread tech. Today I'm going to talk about three innovations that had successes and consequences. The first one I call mother machine. The second one is all about acid. <laughs> And the third one is about forensic science. So let's begin with mother machine. Let's imagine for a moment that you're standing in an amphitheater, not unlike this one, and a doctor is performing. He's got um, a pair of forceps. He's got them around a small child's head, and he's pulling, and he's, he's helping a woman give birth, and the baby's out to great applause of all of his students. He doesn't give the infant to the waiting arms of its mother. He spends the next few minutes cramming it back inside because it's not a real woman. <laughs> During the 18th century, a radical shift occurred. I probably should have started with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a radical shift occurred um, in the sense that anatomy was becoming very important to the practice of midwifery. And also that men midwives were taking over from female practitioners who had been midwives uh, for a long period before that. And for them, it was all about being educated in, a, in the school system. They actually went and took courses. They got certificates. But it's a little bit difficult to practice. For one thing, they're using forceps, which could be very helpful. They could help deliver babies, for instance, if there had been a pelvic deformation, rickets, or something like that. But they're also metal implements that you're going to put somewhere that's rather delicate. How do you practice? Well, one of the ideas is that you could use a machine or a device, a mannequin, a phantom. And one of the most interesting of these was developed by a man named Dr. William Smelly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I didn't even have to put the joke in. <laughs> um, he trained 900 man midwives in 10 years using this device. And it was a quite fascinating piece of machinery. And what it did is it allowed people to get in there and practice the forceps uh, without damaging a live woman. They, often, they actually hung bags of beer in the cavity. So if you punctured one, ah, killed the woman. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> so it was a good thing. Um, they were trying to you know, find ways of training people in, that were, were going to be necess necessary. Smelly's machine was unique in that it had levers, it, had, uh, it wore stockings, it had skin that reformed and was elastic in nature. Um, we don't have any actual pictures of it. Here's one of the 19th century version by, the, uh, by Parvin, I believe, Dr. Parvin. But this machine that I, I spent a lot of time looking for was so lifelike that a physician, actually, Dr. Camper, said he had trouble telling the difference between it and a natural woman. It didn't have a head. so. <laughs> I think that would have been a sticking point for me. Um, it was, in some ways, a perfect 18th century woman in that it gave birth once an hour and didn't have a head. Um, 
But this is one of those examples of it was solving a problem. It was solving the problem of giving men something to practice uh, the forceps on. Uh, we actually have a mannequin at the Dittrich Museum that was used by female midwives, we think. So it's not that they were necessarily bad, but what happens when you lose the sense of the human at the center? Elizabeth Nihel was a female midwife of the same time period, and she criticized the machine because it was too lifelike, she said. You're training men on something which is so much like a human body, but can't feel pain, and can't cry out, and can't die. So again, technology often leads us to great innovations, still does today, but we must remember who's at the center. And in the 18th century, male midwives talked about their labor in birth. So who's giving birth? Whose labor? Becomes a very important question. The second thing I'd like to talk about is acid and accident. Acid, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, behind me is a picture from Wild Wild West, a television show from the 1960s that was in fact steampunk. They lived on a steam engine and they had lots of gadgets and things. And uh, for some reason, in a lot of these shows, there's always vats of acid. Batman, for instance, there's always a villain in a vat somewhere. I actually wonder, it's like skin-melting jacuzzis are just hiding out in abandoned buildings. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, acid was very important. Acid could be used as a battery. Uh, Cragside House in Northumberland uses them in giant fish tanks, actually, to help um, make power consistent. So there probably were vats of it around. But in addition, it had medical applications and it also could be used potentially as a weapon. I'll get to that. This is a steampunk acid gun. It was developed by a cosplayer for Arcanum, a steampunk role-playing game. And one of the characters has this acid gun and it's, a, it's very fascinating. Um, clearly there's nothing in history that, oh, well maybe there is. That's the carbolic acid sprayer. We actually have two of these at the Dittrich Museum. One of them is on display. And the carbolic acid sprayer does kind of look like a steampunk weapon, but in fact it was used to kill germs for surgery. Uh, Lister actually developed it. You've heard of his name before because of Listerine. Yeah, very well done. Um, the thing is, if you know that germs are bad and you want to kill them, it's not very helpful if you don't have a means of doing it. So the carbolic acid sprayer could be used to treat the room, to treat the wound site. It could be used during surgery. It smells terrible, I have proof. There's a small cake of carbolic acid soap in the museum that we keep in a box that we're not allowed to open anymore. Um, but it, it was very powerful stuff and so it could be used for healing. At the same time, it does have a slightly um, darker side and that journal up there is showing a case where uh, a woman who had been spurned by her lover who then married someone else, she throws vitriol on him. In fact, we'll say if someone's particularly angry and has a biting attack that their comments are vitriolic. Sulfuric acid, it appears in a Sherlock Holmes short story, The Illustrious Client, where Kitty Winters throws it on the bad guy and Watson describes it as a painting in which a sponge had been wiped across and just melts the features. It's a really horrible, horrible weapon. So it has all these different aspects to it and the link between acid and forensics is acid can be used to heal, acid can be used to hurt, acid can be used to hide evidence. The acid bath murderer George Hay uh, dissolved his victims and was caught out by forensic specialists because he didn't realize that dental plates wouldn't dissolve. Oops. So, <laughs> forensics and science. You can't actually have a talk about the history of medicine and science and steampunk and not talk about Sherlock Holmes. He's even a character in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And we like Sherlock because he has this aspect of caring about science and technology, and yet at the same time, the savvy, this, this use of his mind, and you think, okay, it's a nice combination of science, technology, and natural gifts for intellect and the human. Okay, behind me there now is Johnny Depp, and this is from uh, the, the movie that I've forgotten the title of, doesn't matter, Sleepy Hollow, that's it. Um, he was actually a forensic pathologist in that movie, and you can see that he has the goggles, he's got the vials and the bottles, and so do we at the Dittrich. These are real things. And in fact, here in Cleveland, we had our own forensic toxicologist, a specialist. His name was John George Spencer. And Spencer's archive, which contains about 13 boxes, is fantastic for its meticulous detail. 
And what I noticed is that he cared so much about the fine details of, well, was it poison? Was it blood? Was this rust stain um, really going to convict a murderer? Frequently it did. In the Racer case, Racer murders his fiance quite brutally, shoots her three times in the face, and then runs over her body with a carriage. But he had the face of a boy, said the papers, and no one believed he was capable of doing it. In the end, he was convicted by a single fleck of rusty blood because John George Spencer analyzed it and discovered it. So it's quite fascinating how tiny details, tiny details, help forensics to solve their cases. This is a lab that belonged to John George Spencer, and you can see it does have that, that atmosphere of steampunk, the bubbling vials, the cauldrons, the goggles, the glass tubes, the poison, you know. It's a fascinating way to make a living. And we've come to honor forensics so much that we have a tendency to rely on it a lot. We have a tendency to think it does more than it does. CSI has been very unfair to the field in general. Like, why hasn't this solved the crime in 35 minutes? <laughs> and relying too much on technology can be its own kind of problem. So for instance, uh, hair DNA is much more difficult to get convictions on than people realize. So while forensics leads to convictions which might otherwise have had guilty people go free, it can occasionally lead to wrongful conviction as well. You can't just rely on the science. It always takes the person behind it. Because technology might be fantastic, but it does have its drawbacks. Even the Victorian technology, even steam power. I want to leave you with a quote by French cultural theorist Paul Virilio. And I quite like what he has to say about accident. He says that the invention of the train, of the steam engine, was the invention of the derailment. The invention of the plane was the invention of the plane crash. The invention of freeways was the invention of a 300 car pileup. In other words, all technologies have the capability, have built within them, in fact, their own catastrophe. And it's up to us to keep the human at the center. It's up to us to look back at the history of medicine and technology and to learn lessons about what it means to be progressing, but to be progressing in the right direction. So I hope you'll come to the Dittrich Museum. I hope you'll check out our social media. We have an Instagram with all sorts of alarming photographs. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Catherine. Uh, we also have a Twitter feed, a Facebook feed, and a website and blog. And I hope you'll join us and take part in some of these journeys into the past to learn more about our shared collective entrance into the modern world with sci science, technology, and medicine. Thank you very much.